Hello, and greetings from East Lansing, Michigan, home of Michigan State University Spartans and the new academic home of UCEA. As the outgoing president of this organization, I am humbled and honored to be speaking to you today. When I was elected president, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be delivering my presidential address via video, or for that matter, that the entire 2020 convention would be moved to a virtual platform. But now, everything has gone virtual. Faculty meetings, classes, office hours, you name it. For better or worse, Zoom has become the medium of choice for academic and scholarly exchange as we've adjusted to our new normal under COVID-19. Because we are in a virtual environment, I will try to keep my remarks short and to the point. This means that I probably won't be able to go into a lot of depth on some issues, and I'll probably gloss over a lot of important and significant details in the process. So I wanna start out with a profound thanks to this year's convention planning team, President Bill Black, Rosa Rivera McCutcheon, James Wright, and Yanira Olivera Ortiz for pivoting to an online format at the 11th hour. The long hours they put in have certainly paid off. On behalf of the executive committee, I wanna publicly thank them, not only for their service, but for literally doing something that has never been done before in the history of UCEA. I also wanna give a shout out to the good folks at UCEA headquarters who also work behind the scenes to make this convention possible. Executive Director and new MSU faculty member, Monica Byrne Jimenez, our convention coordinator, Carl Gildner, Davis Clement, our UCEA postdoc, and all of the MSU graduate students who came together to make the magic happen. Alonzo Gilzine, Lawrence Louie, Target by Nazarov, Dasmond Richards, Eugene O, Brianna Coleman, and Yiching Chang. Putting on a conference takes an enormous amount of work and energy, and I want to give my props to the UCEA team and to the convention planning team for really putting an effort to bring this year's convention to life. So let me start by keeping it real. 2020 has been one hell of a year. COVID-19 has infected over 52 million people across the globe tragically ending the lives of 1.3 million people worldwide. In the United States alone, nearly a quarter of a million people contracted the disease, and over 8,000 people have passed away due to complications from COVID-19. My heartfelt thoughts and condolences are with those who have passed and those who are healing, including their family members, friends, and loved ones. As everyone is well aware, this pandemic radically restructured and transformed our personal and professional lives. Many individuals lost their jobs, while others had to adjust to new working conditions as our work shifted to the home. Some individuals had set up schedules and routines for their family members, while others were forced to deal with increased loneliness and seclusion. Regardless of whether one lives with others or lives alone, there is little doubt that the effects on one's physical, mental, and spiritual health has certainly taken its toll. In 2020, we also dealt with an array, array of racial realisms and racialized assaults. Assaults that reveal the pernicious structural racism that sadly, though not surprisingly, remains at the core of this country. COVID-19 not only disproportionately impacted black and brown communities, revealing deep structural inequities uh, in access to quality healthcare, but we also witnessed how the range of ideological and juridical, and juridical apparatuses from the Oval Office to the police to the courts, worked in tandem to keep black and brown communities at bay, while simultaneously dismissing and or downplaying the role and function of white supremacy in the larger social and political order. Indeed, the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Jacob Blake at the hands of police, and in the case of Ahmaud Arbery at the hands of vigilantes who shot and killed him while he was jogging, are vivid reminders that white supremacy and state-sanctioned violence on black bodies are not only intimately connect connected but in many cases, they're inseparable. And the sad part about it is that white people fully recognize that their whiteness is something special. They intimately understand that whiteness is not only protected in society, but often use their whiteness to patrol and police black and brown bodies on a daily basis. They call the police when the rap music is too loud. They call the police when they think black people don't live in their neighborhood or in their apartment building. They call the police when they don't think black people have a membership to a private gym. They call the police when black people are chilling on their boat. They call the police when black people are sitting on a public bench. They call the police when black people go golfing 
They call the police when someone writes Black Lives Matter on their own property. They call the police when black people birdwatch in a park. Heck, even college professors call the police when black students don't switch seats in a classroom, as happened in Ball State University. All of these incidents didn't happen 100 years ago or 150 years ago. They happened earlier this year, in 2020. While some people may be tempted to minimize these acts and or downplay the racist intent of the perpetrators, oh, they didn't mean it, they would have called the police on anybody regardless of the race, I would argue that as a society, we're always quick and perhaps sometimes too quick to defend and protect white innocence over the psychological, emotional, and spiritual harm that these individuals committed. Unfortunately, as a society, there is an unexamined belief that whiteness should be defended and protected by members of society. To be white, therefore, is to be shielded because society itself was built on discriminatory and often violent practices that made whiteness possible. As Burton cogently summarized, quote, whiteness is simultaneously produced by and productive of the hegemonic structures of white supremacy, end quote. So whiteness has to be protected because it supports the myth of white innocence and virtuousness. So it comes to no surprise that we had an elected official at the highest level in our country that not only downplayed the role of white racism in society and law enforcement in particular, but actively fanned the flames of racial hatred and division in this country. In response to this intense racial climate, 2020 also witnessed a proliferation of protests around the country, beginning in Minneapolis, Minnesota after the death of George Floyd and quickly spreading to over 200 cities in the, in the US and across the globe. These protests led, to, led by the broader Black Lives Matter movement called for an end to rampant police misconduct and abuse, particularly, particularly in the form of excessive force and racial bias in policing. Though these protests, uh, or throughout these protests, black communities called for greater accountability, an end to the rampant militarization of the police, and a shift towards other mechanisms of public safety, including, but not limited to, community-based policing, support for people with drug dependency and addiction, greater mental health infrastructures, capital investments in black communities, and other alternatives to police surveillance. As the protests grew in size and grew in scope, calls to defund the police became increasingly louder within the black community. Such pleas were ridiculed by politicians, community pundits, and media outlets alike, either downplaying the uh, broader claims of racial injustice at the hands of police, or outright dismissing these claims as exaggerated or hyperbolic. As the uprising stretched into the weeks, pundits began to rely on stereotypic tropes of, the black, of black criminality, often painting a picture of inner cities being ruled by chaos and anarchy and black thugs, while simultaneously suggesting that white suburbanites needed to be concerned for their lives and their well-being. This narrative not only served to reinforce the deeply held racist beliefs that black people needed to be surveilled and controlled and regulated, but reified the ideology that white innocence and white material interest needed to be protected and safeguarded. These overtures to the white community in general and white women in particular became a key focus of the 2020 presidential election. Now, I need to be honest. For me, the most anxiety producing event of 2020 had to be the presidential election. And I say that with some trepidation because I don't wanna minimize the severity of COVID-19 and the anxiety and stress and angst that it produced and continues to produce. However, with the presidential election, it brought up a whole different set of emotions for me because I truly felt that, that much more was at stake than the selection of a mere candidate. We were voting for a person who might lead us out of the self-inflicted and botched response to COVID-19. We were voting for a person who would elevate science and sound medical advice uh, to guide decision-making. We were voting for a person who would surround himself with qualified, knowledgeable people as part of his cabinet. We were voting for a person who would not put kids in cages, separate families, or vilify undocumented communities. We were voting for a person who believed in the power of diversity. We were voting for a person who would not enable white supremacists and their sympathizers through dog whistle and racially coded rhetoric. We were voting for a person who would not foment religious animus in this country. We were voting for a person who would not put who would put sorry education as a top priority. We were voting for justice. We were voting for equity.
But most of all, we were voting for someone who had some competence and leadership skills, someone who was, vis who was driven by vision and purpose, as opposed to, driven, uh, to being driven by ego and conceit. And the same trepidation and fear and, and that I currently am feeling was probably felt on the opposite side as well by people who support our current president. And although the election results are all but over, the election results uh, have still not been called because the legal challenges and um, because of legal challenges and accusations of voter fraud. And so we continue to wait until either Trump concedes, which he shows no signs of doing, or his legal challenges prove to be true, which there is no legal evidence so far that either voter fraud or voter tampering occurred, or his legal challenges prove to be false, which may take time to sort out in a court of law. So in a nutshell, the madness of 2020 continues. And it's only November, so 2020 is still not over. So as I think about the year 2020, I wonder what will we, what will we remember about this year? What memories of 2020 will endure? What will we tell future generations about the events that transpired this particular year? Or better yet, what will future generations remember about 2020? I believe that one of the dominant narratives that will emerge will contain elements of chaos, confusion, loss, and anxiety. Not only will we remember the loss of lives due to COVID-19, but we will also remember other losses as well. The loss of jobs, the loss of day-to-day -day routines, the loss of our sense of safety, the loss of our very autonomy. I believe that trauma, loss, and grief will emerge as dominant themes of 2020, particularly in light of the massive sense of uncertainty and unpredictab unpredictability in our world. I do think that we're experiencing trauma at multiple levels, and there is no doubt that once the dust settles, we'll enter the stage of intense post-traumatic stress disorder, not only as a nation, but as a world. What we won't remember as easily, however, will be those stories of joy, those stories of self-preservation, the stories of endurance, the stories of connections and reconnections that we made with our loved ones or our pets or even ourselves. In other words, very few people will remember those moments that actually made us forget we were on lockdown. Those are the stories that probably won't get told or won't be remembered by future generations. Instead, what future generations will remember and well beyond 2020 will probably be very different and distinct than what we actually experienced and lived through in the present day. This has less to do with our inability to document the totality of what we experienced or are living through and more to do with the fact that memory is as much a social phenomenon as it is a cognitive phenomenon. And because me memory is partially social in nature, what is remembered is as much an act of recollecting as as much as it is an act of filtering out what we deem worthwhile to recollect. For example, what I deem important to remember in the present day does not represent the totality of what I experience, or for that matter, even a sliver of what I experience. It is what I have deemed to be worthy of being documented and remembered. In the same way that media outlets don't report all the news, but only what they deem to be newsworthy for their subscribers, what gets lucky, therefore, passed down to future generations is a highly selective process. In short, what is remembered is simultaneously a process of distillation and forgetting as much as it is a process of recollecting and remembering. The late social anthropologist Paul Connerton believed that memory is not necessarily an individual faculty as it is a social one. The main thesis in his groundbreaking book, How Societies Remember, is that our experiences of the present largely depend upon our knowledge of the past. Connerton believed that since what is inherited from the past is filtered and distilled, then our present day knowledge must also be distorted. This is not to suggest that our memories or our recollections are necessarily false, but that memory itself might actually be a societal product. And since society is not homogenous, different societies actually process different vocabularies of understanding. In fact, he argues that even within the same society, different generations have different memory sets and are therefore isolated from each other.
This has major implications for societies and organizations like UCEA, for example, that have gone through significant changes over time because different generations can coexist with each other in the same physical space and yet be mentally and emotionally insulated from each other, as Connerton suggests. In essence, the memories of older generations may in fact be substantively, if not radically different, from those of newer generations. According to Connerton, there are three types of memory, personal memory, cognitive memory, and habit memory. Personal memories are acts of remembering that one has personally experienced. These memories are unique to the individual and highlight an experience or occurrence that one has encountered. For example, I might say, I remember my first UCEA conference. It was at the Gold House in Louisville, Kentucky in 1996. I distinctly remember some of the people who were at my very first presentation. Janie Lindell, Kathy Lug, Bill Boyd, Bill Firestone, Pedro Reyes, David Berliner. These memory claims are highly individual, reflective, and particular. As Connerton described them, personal memories often take the form of, I did such and such, at such and such a time, in such and such a place. Cognitive memory, on the other hand, involves a cognitive experience or a sensory state that one has experienced in the past, such as learning a song lyric, memorizing an equation, or reciting the Gettysburg Address. In contrast to personal memory, one does not need to remember the context or even the details of what, uh, what, uh, what occurred or what happened, but simply that the cognitive experience happened at some point in the past. For example, I can tell you that Harold Laswell coined the phrase, who gets what, when, and how, when describing politics. I can also tell you that Bowman and Deal developed a four-frame model for studying organizations. I learned those at some point in graduate school, but I don't remember the details of when or how I, com I, uh, I committed these, these theories to memory. The last type of memory described by Connerton is habit memory, and these are memories that emerge from repeated activity or performance. While many habit memories necessitate some form of cognition, especially as one is learning how to do the activity, once an activity is learned, it simply becomes automatic. Riding a bike, how to read, how to write, are all forms of habit memory. As such, habit memory is different from cognitive memory in that the latter actually requires some sort of recollection. For example, I can tell you from memory that there are five tenets to critical race theory, and I can tell you what those tenets are. And while these tenets come naturally to me, they are actually a type of cognitive memory because I'm recalling those from my memory set. Habit memories, however, are different because they require no cognitive recollection. These memories are simply incorporated into one's understanding of the, of the world. Connerton believes that social memory is primarily a form of habit memory. In effect, the memories that we have about an event or an occurrence is in part socially produced. Although individual members within a society may recall different versions of the same story, social groups generally understand history through stories that are told again and again and again until they become automatic. The facts aren't as important as the general gist of the story itself. For example, within UCEA lore, there's an old story that involves Bob, Bob Stout Martha McCarthy, and Jay Scribner. The story goes something like this. In the early 80s, Bob, Martha, and Jay were sitting around a table brainstorming, brainstorming about how to take UCEA to the next level. When, suddenly out of nowhere, Martha McCarthy casually suggests, I think we ought to have a convention. And thus, the UCEA convention was born. This story was actually told in a previous presidential address. Now, there's no evidence that this actually happened. There's no witnesses. No one was there to document that historical moment. Moreover, neither Martha McCarthy nor Jay Scribner actually re recall that this incident ever happened. And yet, the story has become an unofficial part of UCEA's history. Individuals repeat that story, and the story is often, as, is often accepted as fact, even though the actual facts of how UCEA convention was born differ than what is often shared and communicated by individuals within our organization.
The purpose of using that example is not to shame or ridicule my colleagues who tell that UCEA origin story, but to simply highlight the power of social memory and how social memory requires no actual recollection or evidence. I am also using this account to highlight the power of a good story and how stories are socially communicated and become internalized by members of a group through continued repetition. These stories become the stock stories or the deep stories that we adopt as truths within a particular society or organization. Many of us familiar with the notion of stock story know that it comes from the work of Derek Bell, the grandfather of critical race theory. Professor Bell believed that stock stories are those ideological narratives or majoritarian tropes that we've internalized within the US. For example, the American dream, the Horatio Alger's bootstrap story, the belief in meritocracy, the stories um, that uh, society and social arrangements are fair and equitable. Bell believed that these stock stories exist precisely because they, communi they communicate a powerful ideology of and about our current reality. In other words, they not only represent deeply held values and unspoken or perhaps unconscious collective memories, but exist because they justify contemporary social arrangements. Derek Bell claimed that what is conveniently left out of these majoritarian stories is evidence that challenges, disproves, or runs counter to the stock story. Things like structural racism, anti-blackness, settler colonialism, white supremacy, xenophobia. Those are the counter stories, Bell argues, stories that are hidden, stories that challenge or taken for granted assumptions of truth, subaltern stories that never get told or never get disseminated. In other words, those are the stories that are not told because they don't fit our pre-existing cognitive schema. In similar fashion, Connerton would suggest that the counter story is left out because of strategic forgetting. In other words, it's not that we don't believe the counter story or because the counter story is false, but that the counter story simply isn't socialized and disseminated in the popular discourse in the same way that the stock story is taken up and dispersed. The reason for this is because at its core, the stock story reveals as it communicates something about us, either how we perceive ourselves or how we want others to perceive us. We circulate stock stories within society because they affirm our ideological predilections. In effect, what ultimately gets inscribed in our social memory as a result of this habitual back and forth is simultaneously a process of remembering as it is a process of forgetting. Yet, the counter story remains. Its presence and its existence is important because it is the story or the stories of the outgroup, the minoritized, the subaltern, those who exist on the border, those whose voices and perspectives, the very conscious, whose, uh, whose very consciousness has been suppressed, devalued, and abnormalized. These are the voices that have been forgotten. Theirs are the stories that don't get socialized, circulated, and inscribed in habit memory. As countless critical race scholars suggest, there's a lot of power in the counter story, namely the power to present a counter reality, the power to subvert stock stories, the power to challenge and destabilize powerful ideologies, the power to disrupt the status quo. Richard Delgado, a renowned critical uh, race scholar and lat crit scholar in his own right, states in his classic Michigan, Michigan Law Review article that, quote, counter stories can serve an important destructive function. They can show what we believe is ridiculous, self-serving or cruel. They can show us the way out of a trap of, of unjustified exclusion. They can help us understand when it is time to reallocate power. They are the other half, the destructive half of the creative dialectic, end quote. The power of the counter story, therefore, is not only to reveal what is taken for granted, but also to expose what is concealed or strategically forgotten with the hope of reinscribing power dynamics and transforming power relations. This brings me back to UCEA and the stock stories that have become social memories or habit memories within our organization. For me, the stock story of UCEA goes a little something like this. Once upon a time in the late 1940s, members of AASA met with the Kellogg Foundation to discuss ways to improve the preparation of school leaders. 
The foundation made two large grants to fund a nationwide initiative that became known as the Cooperative Program on Educational Administration. That was housed at Teachers College, Columbia University. By 1959, several other institutions joined that consortium. Jack Culbertson was offered the position to lead the new organization, and he had the blessings of several members of the Teachers College faculty. As the organization grew, so did the research interests of its members. Eventually, the organization outgrew its roots in logical positivism and the Vienna School, and began to incorporate new ideas and new thoughts, especially from the humanities. By the late 1960s, UCEA started to address issues of race and equity. By the early 1970s, UCEA had to meet a, a broad array of logistical and financial challenges as member institutions became more localized and as individual scholars pursued more parochial interests, such as urban education, special education, Native American education, and Black education. A focus on women, namely cisgendered women, uh, uh, began to take shape in the late 1970s when Paula Silver joined UCEA as the first female associate director. Silver gathered data on program graduates, targeting females and people of color to obtain administrative posts. This drew backlash from, the, from white male members who claimed that her project was tantamount to reverse discrimination. Nevertheless, the program advanced and training materials were developed. Unfortunately, those materials were never broadly disseminated. Soon thereafter, several UCEA members called for a new journal, one that would focus on gender and racial diversity. The new journal was approved and ultimately named the Journal of Educational Equity and Leadership. That was launched in 1980 and was published for seven volume years. Many educators, including a sizable number of women and people of color, published in that journal. By the late 80s and early 90s, scholars of color began attending UCEA convention in, uh, in larger numbers, though in actuality, the numbers were considerably small. By the early 2000s, the number of attendees who were people of color began to grow exponentially. By then, faculty of color and women had made it into leadership positions within the organization. UCEA, UCEA had hired its first female executive director in Michelle Young, while scholars like Linda Tillman, Malu Gonzalez, Judy Austin, Carla Murtada, Michael Dantley, Kathy Lugg, and Linda Warner were powerful voices that demanded recognition and change from within. Then in 2003, the Barbara Jackson Scholars Program uh, put issues of racial diversity front and center, and it propelled UCEA on a path towards greater equity. And the rest of this, as they say, is history, the end. While this particular narrative left out a lot of UCEA history, one can still pick out elements and major themes in that story. Most notably that UCEA has been on the steady path towards greater and greater equity since its inception. We learned, for example, that the focus on equity began sometime in the late 1960s and really took shape by the late 1970s. The launch of the new journal opened up spaces for, uh, uh, for avenue and avenues for new voices and perspectives. And by the early 90s, UCEA began to notice a shift in representation as more women and more scholars of color entered the profession. The development of the Barbara L. Jackson Scholars Network in the early 2000s was a watershed moment in UCEA's history as it opened up new opportunities for scholars of color to attend the convention while creating a strong pathway towards the, towards the professorate. UCEA is now seen as a space where diversity is embraced and where scholars of color can thrive. You can actually hear it reflected in the way people talk about UCEA. Oh, we've come so far. UCEA is so diverse. UCEA just feels so different now. But I worry about the voices and perspectives that are left out of this stock story, especially the perspectives of black scholars, of non-black scholars of color, of our native and indigenous scholars, of LGBTQIA plus scholars, of scholars with disabilities, of our immigrant scholars, of our international scholars, of our scholars of diverse faiths, of our scholars whose identities intersect in beautiful and complex ways. How are they experiencing UCEA? Do they also see it as a diverse and welcoming space? Do they feel that their identity is valued and respected? Do they feel that they can thrive in this organization? In other words, does the stock story of diversity and acceptance actually represent the range of marginalized and minoritized voices? Or is the stock story simply one that we as an organization have created to congratulate and feel good about ourselves? 
because it's hard to feel welcomed in UCEA if you're a Native American scholar, and there has never been a Native American president in the history of UCEA. It's hard to feel welcomed if you're an Asian American or a Pacific Islander, and there's been only one president who's been Asian American. It's hard to feel welcomed if you're deaf and the leadership doesn't represent your community, or you have to fight tooth and nail with the executive committee to get an ASL interpreter at each and every UCEA conference. It's hard to feel welcomed if you're trans and no one ever considers putting pronouns on your name tags so that people can refer to you and to everyone else by their identity. It's hard to feel welcome if you're of the Muslim faith and no one thinks about designating a space for prayer at the convention. It's hard to feel welcomed if all the awards are named after white people. It's hard to feel welcomed if you're from an HBCU, an HSI, or a tribal college, and you're constantly treated like a second-class citizen because your institution isn't research generating. It's hard to feel welcomed if you're Black and you don't see the organization actively examining and addressing anti-Blackness in its policies and its practices. These are just a few examples of the stories that have been left out of the UCEA diversity narrative. The fact remains that marginalized communities have a profoundly different experience of UCEA than our non-marginalized counterparts. For many of us, UCEA has been and remains a space of distrust of fear and of suspicion. It's a space where trauma is not only enacted, but actively flourishes. My worry is that we've created a particular memory of UCEA, a memory that has been distilled, a memory that has been filtered, a memory that has been cleaned of its impurities. But I want to be clear, there is no doubt that we have come a long way since the 1950s but we've still got a long way to go before we can say with certainty that we're a more equitable and just organization. So I wanna end with these final words. As an organization, we can and we must be better at remembering. But the only way that we can be better at remembering is if we refuse to forget. I appreciate your time and I thank you for placing your trust in me to serve as your president.